Well, uh, accordingly, um, um, as I'm retired, I'm not going to be speaking for the EPA. Um, and this overview I'm going to give you is actually pretty technical and very, very dry, um, uh, unlike what, uh, what Jeff was able to <laughs> colorfully present. Uh, but I, what I will try and do is go through this quickly. I won't read it either. Uh, it, it'll be made available by the Total Green, and, and if somebody really wants to take a hard look at it, they can. But I think you'll get a flavor of some of the issues from this, and hopefully uh, I won't fall asleep as you look at all of this stuff. But stay tuned to the end, because then it'll probably get more interesting. Um, basically what I'm going to cover is the EPA and other government agency roles in uranium mining and processing. Next slide. Um, I'm going to talk about conventional mines and uh, conventional mills, the uranium in situ to leach recovery, and I should point out that the industry has tried to go to in situ to recovery, or IRSR, as their preferred acronym, because uh, in situ leaching doesn't sound quite as, as, uh, as appetizing. Um, talk a little bit about a ban in mine reclamation and also EPA's ongoing uh, regulatory reviews, which Jeff was alluding to. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, Due to uh, statutory authorities uh, implementing regulations, uh, the type of uranium extraction facility and uh, land ownership, the federal and state agencies may play very different roles for each site. Thank you. Um, uh, and state by state, the federal agency delegations of authority may also result in different administrative requirements for each site. Uh, and so the state of play is, it is it just is not as simple as it would seem on paper. Um, uh, many times a federal agency will delegate its authority to do certain things to a state and how they implement it, how they inspect the facility, may be very different than what a uh, federal agency may have done. So, uh, next slide. Um, okay, so what does EPA do? Well, it, as, as alluded to here by Jeff, uh, um, they provide environmental and radiation protection standards for conventional mills, uh, ISL or ISR, and uh, heat bleach facilities. And that's primarily through the 40 CFR 192 regulations. Uh, in the uh, uh, Uranium Mine Tailings Radiation Control Act, 1978, uh, as amended, uh, it, it basically set up a, a division of authority and responsibility between EPA, the Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Energy. They said, EPA, we want you to set the, set the broad brush radiation protection and environmental protection requirements. Uh, and these will be utilized by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for how it licenses any uh, um, uh, and oversees any existing facilities that, that you license, as well as future operations. But again, these are mills. And of course, as, as Jeff was saying, uh, these are for ISL facilities, this includes milling underground, which is how NRC uh, regulates it because it produces the waste product or byproduct material, which is found at conventional mills as well as the ISL. Uh, and for DOE, there were uh, a number of facilities that had uh, been abandoned, conventional mills, and the tailings uh, um, from that, those operations were so hazardous, they were, uh, there were no controls on how they were being used. They were being used to construct houses, roads, schools, uh, 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 sidewalks, house foundations, and the radioactivity was just, just a, a real, real big issue. And so. Congress wanted to control the access to this, so they said, okay, under this, this law, we're going to have uh, the Department of Energy reclaim these sites, put the tailings off limits so that they're not used for these other kinds of purposes. So EPA set its regulations back in 1983 um, that basically provided for the restoration of these sites and also moving forward with new facilities that might come online. Um, now, uh, um, the... Uh, uh, the EPA comments and, and uh, provides uh, uh, reviews for uh, other federal agency and state agency uh, environmental assessments for facilities uh, in, in accordance with, with NEPA, and that can include mines uh, and the, the different environmental assessments that may be provided or environmental impact statements by both federal and state agencies. Um, uh, and, and with the exception of, uh, unless these requirements or authorities are delegated, also they provide uh, um, the uh, uh, release standards, uh, 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 the uh, uh, construction approvals for uranium metal tailings impoundments, uh, 
and uh, also for uranium, underground uranium mines. This is the radon release uh, standard. Um, uh, injection uh, well uh, UIC permits, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, aquifer exemptions for uranium ISL facilities, we'll talk about this uh, here in, in, in a little bit. Uh, also, uh, stormwater releases or permits uh, under the uh, uh, Clean Water Act and then uh, RIPRA permitting uh, for hazardous uh, substances, although that, that's been mostly delegated to the states. Next. Okay. Uh, land ownership. Um, if, uh, the state, federal, or mixed ownership determines the agencies that have <coughs> jurisdiction over sites uh, and also for permitting, uh, exploration permits. Um, federal land management agencies can include the Interior Department, uh, Agencies, uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, uh, as, a, as a good example, uh, um, the uh, Department of Agriculture or the Forest Service, but also the Department of Energy, which has been involved in, in uh, holding its own uranium uh, lease sales recently. Um, and the, the problem with the exploration is there is a great inconsistency between what states, uh, what states and even federal agencies will be doing on the various sites where there's new uh, exploration going on. And some agencies are only now just beginning to understand the differences between radioactivity and what may be produced as a result of exploring for uranium versus uh, a, a conventional hard rock mine. Um, and so that's, uh, that was reflected in the states that I was visiting here in the last uh, number of years. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, I'm going to give you an example of... Uh, uh, some of the uh, problems you face with conventional mines. This is for a site that's uh, uh, where there are actually a number of operating uranium underground mines in Utah, and this is in San Juan County. Uh, and uh, what they're trying to do now with the two mining companies that are, are primarily involved, uh, uh, Denison and Reliance, is to, to come up with a more combined uh, uh, review of of um, the uh, exploration and production that's going to be going on in this area. Um, and here you can see what the problems are with the ownership uh, situation. Uh, there are a number of, of mines, the underground mine portals are, are pointed to in orange. Um, the Bureau of Land Management uh, leases and patents are shown in uh, purple. The Forest Service, uh, uh, Manning the South Forest Lands are in green. And then the uh, uh, State of Utah has leases that you can see in uh, the uh, uh, blue stripes, and then private lands are in, in orange. Okay, next slide. I don't expect you to be reading this, but basically there's there have been a number of previous administrative uh, uh, approvals that have uh, taken place there um, between the State of Utah and the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service. Uh, there's quite a, a lot of overlap, but it, they apply as permits for their own individual lands. Um, the, uh, the new proposal for development for this area is to expand the number of, of, of acres for disturbance. Uh, it basically will double the amount of land that's going to be uh, uh, involved here, and most of the disturbance is related to those portals that you saw in the uh, previous uh, slide. Um, and then plus increasing the number of um, uh, venting locations uh, for uh, uh, providing fresh air into the mines. Uh, one of the big problems for underground uranium mining is that the um, uranium um, and uh, its byproduct material ra uh, radium give off a lot of radon gas. A lot of what we know now about uh, the impacts of, of uranium and even atomic energy and the, is, is based on the, the epidemiological studies that have been done on, on uranium miners, going back to Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, uh, and where we learned that the radon uh, daughter products um, accumulate in, in uh, the lungs and uh, bodies of the workers, and the increased exposure to that over time is, is what uh, results in cancer uh, uh, mor uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, and so what happens is that we have standards that have been established and that, that are, that are uh, uh, over to oversee the uh, activities on the federal lands, uh, but they also like to work with the states. So sometimes what will happen is that there will be memorandums of understanding or agreement between the various agencies to decide who goes out and does these inspections. Um, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the, the landowner or the land management agency can't go out to these sites because they do but they try and give a lead if they can to make sure that uh, 
uh, they, they provide uh, uh, a unified approach to how they oversee these, uh, these facilities. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we're in, in, when we, we talk about conventional mills, uh, and this is going to take a few slides to go through, each of these federal agencies, based on the responsibilities given to them through the, uh, uh, the Uranium Mill Tailings Radiation Control Act, the Atomic Energy Act, the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, RICRA, uh, uh, all of those uh, federal uh, uh, statutes, the media laws, as well as the state statutes, provide that there's a whole lot of things that have to go on. So, uh, surprisingly, uh, these companies are able to prov uh, to go out and put in and lease these lands and put in for developing new mines and mills uh, because of the potential for profit. And just as as, as uh, my other Lauren here was was talking about, the increase in, in price of uranium is providing a difference in terms of of the affordability of, of mining. Uh, in many cases, these facilities, the, the cost of production may be uh, half of what the, the uh, current price of uranium is. So that profit is, is what they can plow back in and make this uh, an underground mine, uh, even as labor intensive as it is, a profitable operation. So what you see here is that uh, um, there's a feedback loop for a lot of this stuff. <coughs> EPA has developed its uh, 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 standards. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission in their um, regulatory uh, uh, scheme has taken those standards, they've, implement, they've inc uh, incorporated them into what their regulations are, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, they are to provide the operating uh, standards for um, the uh, uranium mills and the ISL facilities. Um, and it becomes very, very complicated. Nevertheless, um, the uh, NRC, once they've received an application for a license, will develop uh, a couple of things. That license has technical stuff that they use um, for a technical analysis of the site. They also have environmental information that's used for developing uh, an EIS. <coughs> and so what happens is they put out the EIS. It, it's reviewed by EPA uh, and the other federal agencies. Um, and that information comes back to the NRC. Uh, uh, and then they will develop a final environmental impact statement, take the information that's gained from that, and hopefully utilize that in their final evaluation of the license application by the company, and then put out a final license. EPA has a, an authority under the Clean Air Act to review these, these environmental statements, and not just the draft, but also the final, and comment on, on what they've seen from the NRC. And so in this, this particular case, uh, um, you know, that they have been fairly active. They could even raise it to the Council of Environmental Quality if they don't like what they've seen. And that has not happened recently, unfortunately. Um, there's discharge permits. There's uh, groundwater protection. Uh, uh, air, air emission uh, controls. EPA is involved in approving uh, the construction of underground uranium mines as well as uh, the mill tailings impoundments under the authority from the Clean Air Act. Um, this is to control radon emissions, and there are standards which are, which are uh, involved in what we call the uh, NESHAPs, uh, National uh, uh, Hazardous Emissions uh, uh, Standards. And um, uh, all of that is, is taken into account. All of these agencies are involved in providing <coughs> some sort of oversight for what's going on next. Um, and so uh, once, uh, once uh, uh, the uh, facility has gone through its production cycle uh, and it's, it's, it's ready for, for uh, decommissioning. And then uh, what uh, the NRC may do is to uh, um, uh, make some determinations about how the, de the decommissioning of the site can occur. Um, they are able to grant uh, if uh, they, the uh, uh, company has a mill, they've contaminated groundwater underneath the mill and the superficial aquifer, uh, they may allow a facility to have alternate concentration limits that, as Jeff was talking about, if they can't meet the MCLs or the baseline standards for, for the water at that site, um, they can actually go through a process which is outlined in the EPA standards to make a determination that they can go to some higher level of contaminants uh, in, in the site uh, if they believe that they will meet um, uh, a public health and environmental protection uh, 
uh, requirements which have been set out. Um, the Department of Energy uh, works with the NRC in, in looking at these decommissioning of these sites. Uh, and then once a mill is uh, decommissioned, then the, the, these properties are, are basically ceded right. to the Department of Energy for, uh, for institutional control uh, in perpetuity. And the Department of Energy uh, monitors these sites. They, they, uh, they have uh, groundwater monitoring. They look at these uh, annually. Um, and they are involved in, in uh, maintaining the sites so that the, uh, um, the dusts don't um, blow away from, from, the, uh, from the mill tailings and also that the groundwater in the vicinity areas are, are, are protected. Next. Um, this just basically outlines the do loop for, uh, for the environmental impact statements. Uh, I won't, won't go through that for you, but each of the agencies is involved in, in preparing environmental statements or reviewing them. Um, in, in many cases, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will work with the Bureau of Land Management, for example. Uh, BLM, because of the, surf, of the surficial uh, estate and control, may prepare uh, the environmental impact statement. In, uh, for the, the, the NRC, um, and, uh, and then that, that's reviewed uh, by, by EPA and the other agencies, the information going back, as I showed before, to, uh, to the NRC. Um, okay, next slide. Um, now, the state licensing lead. NRC, in accordance with UMTRCA, is allowed to uh, delegate its authority for oversight of, of uranium milling for the issuance of, of licenses to the states which have incorporated the NRC's regulations uh, into their own state uh, regulations. Um, so far only three uh, states, uh, Texas, Colorado, and Utah are considered as agreement states for the, uh, for the uranium milling. Um, now the principal differences with the NRC licensing lead is that the uh, um, uh, that the state have, as I say, be consistent with NRCs, but they also can uh, can be stricter. For example, as, as Jeff was talking about with, with the state of Colorado, um, the um, state environmental assessment requirements may differ from the federal agencies um, because of, of the way that it works. They they may only provide an environmental or the equivalent of what would might be an environmental assessment for a facility rather than a, uh, what we would look view as an environmental impact statement. Uh, and they're also not necessarily responsive to the, the federal review from the, the, the uh, EPA. Next slide. All right, I'll go on to the uranium in situ to uh, leach recovery. Um, okay, the um, additional EPA responsibilities here um, is that uh, um, The EPA standards, which have been set forward in our UMTRCA requirements and are utilized by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, have been applied to the ISL recovery facilities. And they are required uh, to, with, with their, their licensees, to restore groundwater um, in the aquifer to baseline or MCLs. Um, uh, but uh, uh, another a law, the uh, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, allows and, and basically sets up a system for EPA to uh, exempt the aquifer where the production is taking place from uh, protections of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, now, you, that, that would seem to be at odds. Um, the EPA uh, is, uh, is also the authority for uh, approving uh, underground injection control wells. These are injection wells, as you saw with, with Lawrence and, and uh, uh, with uh, the talk by, uh, by Jeff, that where the lixivian is put into the aquifer for producing the uranium. So EPA has a responsibility and an approval authority. Unless EPA approves the aquifer exemption uh, and the UIC wells through permitting, then uh, a company cannot uh, commence its uh, its production from that facility, even if it has received a license from the, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or in fact uh, an agreement state. Um, uh, the principal uh, effort through the Safe Drinking Water Act, in in this case with the aquifer exemption, is actually to provide for protection of the aquifers outside of the exempted areas. So, 
is that even though you may have um, damaged the aquifer <coughs> in the location of where the, uh, the uh, ISL has actually taken place, it does provide for protection for the aquifer beyond it. So what you'll see here is on the uh, left side is a pattern of wells that constitutes the well field uh, and surrounding it are a series of monitoring wells which look for, for indications that groundwater may be moving beyond the, uh, the well field and may potentially contaminate the, uh, uh, the other aquifers in the area. Um, many of these, uh, many of the, uh, or a certain number of the wells that are in the well field actually will be used to monitor uh, production. So there's a better sense of whether or not the exhibit is moving beyond where the product, where it's supposed to, um, so that production can be adjusted as uh, as production is occurring. And then on the right, what you see is uh, the area where there's uh, uh, the ore zone is an orange project area, which is the uh, the areas where the the well fields uh, uh, will, will exist. And then you've got a monitoring well, which is providing a buffer between where the, the uh, uh, uranium ore zone would occur and the well fields are producing and uh, 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 hopefully some distance to be able to uh, to look out for when there's excursions. And then... Do you have uh, a sense of how big that is overall? It, it depends. Or? Well, it depends on the, um, uh, uh, the individual facility. Some of these uh, well fields uh, uh, in areas that are involved, maybe only uh, a thousand or, or two thousand acres. In some cases, they're more than ten thousand acres, so they can be pretty, pretty ex expansive with and multiple sites. Right, and they, what may happen is that that as they pr they produce, they will uh, shut down or decommission one field and move on to the next in a series. So if you've got a sinuous uranium deposit, they'll produce one area, they'll produce it out begin to close down that area and move on to the next until they've covered the entire uh, ore zone. 